Welcome to 30 Minutes to Wealth, the show that teaches you how to build wealth through real estate. Our company, ProFunds Mortgages, has assisted real estate investors in achieving wealth for over two decades. Over the next 30 minutes, we're going to share some of our key strategies in real estate with you. Right here on 30 Minutes to Wealth. Hi, I'm Carmen and this is Jordan. Welcome to 30 Minutes to Wealth. The show that teaches you how to build wealth through real estate. Today on the show, we're excited to be talking about investing in self-storage facilities, which is an extremely lucrative real estate investment opportunity that is growing in popularity. We're so thrilled to share the knowledge and expertise of Jamie Walker. She's a self-storage consultant, and she's coming on our show to show us how to make money in this industry. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Jordan, this is Carmen. Welcome back to 30 Minutes to Wealth. We're here with our guest, Jamie Walker. Jamie, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. It's very exciting. Yeah, it's going to be an awesome episode. We're talking about investing in self, self-storage self facilities. Now, this is a increasingly popular real estate investment strategy that's just you know, becoming a little bit more well known. Um, it's a lot more niche. So talk to us about how you got started in this space. Through a cold call, actually. I started in commercial brokerage about four years ago, and a parcel of land had come up available for sale through the brokerage, and everyone was kind of brainstorming, okay, what are we gonna do with this employment zoned land? And it was like, well, what about storage? So I got on the phone, and I just started calling everybody I could possibly think of and find in Google. Public storage ended up buying the land, and through that series of cold calls, a group it was like, why don't you do this full time? Let's teach you a little bit about storage. So over the last four years, I've been traveling the country, meeting with owners and operators and talking about their investment strategies and how to make the most of either buying, selling their property, investment management, those kinds so of things. So you're an independent self-storage? Yes, completely independent. So I work with buyers, sellers, builders, developers, landowners. Who are you a real estate just, agent as well? I am also a licensed agent. I yes. see. Okay. Very so that's cool. great. So you actually... You find the location, the land, and then what's what's involved in your consultations? Like, what do you actually do for a client? It depends on what they're looking for. So people could be looking for any anything, really. They could just call and say, hey, I own this farmland, and I don't know what to do with it. But mm -hmm. as you mentioned, storage is a really hot topic right now. So yeah. it's something that's ca captured a lot of people's attention. Mm -hmm. So they could be calling about an industrial building that they own and want to convert, a piece of land that they want to build on, a site that they want to sell. Maybe they're involved in another asset class, and they're looking to learn more about storage. Are there opportunities to buy? And this conversation is a national, wow. is a national one. So. Now talk to us about what exactly self-storage is. Cell storage has changed a lot from what we yeah. see in the movies and television. Yeah. The drive yes. ups on the outskirts of town that you would never want to go to after dark. Yeah, yeah those like, are like scary ghetto exactly. places in the back suburbs somewhere. It's not like that anymore. Those yeah. absolutely exist, but we're see we don't see them built that way anymore. And now they're rivaling A class office buildings with the mm. highest technology that you could possibly imagine, and they're they're beautiful. Like you could be driving through Lee Side and you're like, oh look at that office, and then all of a sudden and you'll see a sign for self-storage, and it's, awesome. it's completely yeah. transformed over the course of the last probably decade yeah. and really increased in popularity in the last four years. I know, I've been I doing really it. want to, I think maybe I'm a little late in the game, uh, but I would love to acquire some self-storage. There's still a lot of opportunity out there. There are probably only five or six really big national players that are out there, but there's 3,000 independently owned storage facilities coast to coast. So it doesn't mean that just because you don't have an existing storage infrastructure that you can't get involved in the storage game. I have I have a million questions for you. Okay. I don't even know where to start. But um, so let's go back to the your, your, cons your consultations. What do you do? Do you actually find the land, help them acquire, get their approvals? help them get construction budgets? Like, do you do all of that? Or? I can, if I can't do it, I can put you in touch with the people that can do it. So I'll get calls from different groups asking if I know of any parcels. I can go out and cold call just like anybody else. I'm more looking to work with people that have an existing piece of land or have an existing building. What can they do with that land or that building? Does it work for storage? Is it in the right area? Would they get the right returns? What does that look like? Is it worth doing a joint venture partnership with one of the bigger groups? Who are those groups? Depending on the market that they're in, can I make those introductions? Are you looking to buy? Are you looking to sell? Can I make those introductions? Right. So it really depends on what you own, who you are, what you're looking for, mm -hmm. there's kind of a little bit of something for everybody. Wow, okay. Now, what areas of Canada would you say are like the most 
popular right now for, or like the best areas for investing in self-storage? So we're seeing the most development in Greater Van, Greater Toronto, and in Montreal. Mm -hmm. But if you are looking to acquire an existing asset, you don't want to go head to head with the big guys. You want to be looking in the more urban areas and tertiary markets mm -hmm. up north. Maybe you want to go up to Sudbury. Maybe you want to go. Really? Yeah. Sudbury? Like, you'd be surprised because yeah, there's still a lot of smaller sites that aren't being sold for 20, 30, 50 million dollars. You can go in and you can buy 10,000, 15,000 square feet of self storage that maybe the bigger guys aren't looking for. So mm -hmm. if they don't have an existing infrastructure in that place already, it's not really worth their time and energy to send their regional managers out that area. But if you live in that area, or if that's something that's of interest to you, then that's an opportunity that now, you might be not. Are they still lucrative, like a, a smaller self-storage like that, 10, 15,000? They absolutely can be. And the reason for this is unlike the large groups who are constantly pressing out or pushing out rental increases, oftentimes independently owned storage facilities aren't pushing rates at the aggressive rate that the other groups are. So they could have had tenants in there that haven't had a rental increase in 10 years. They're still paying $20 a square foot instead of $30 a square foot, or they're paying 10 instead of 20. Mm -hmm. So if you're gonna go in as an investor, you really wanna take a look at what the rates are, what the occupancy is, and the last time that they were increased, and whether or not there's an opportunity for growth there. And what would you say are those typical rates that people are seeing? And I know it, it completely depends yeah. on the market, but you're saying, you know, someone's, renting out for 20 versus 30, where is a ballpark that people should kind of aspire to be at? So if you were going to acquire an existing site, it's you probably want to do the old school cold call. So call up the neighbor facility, mm -hmm. neighboring mm -hmm. facilities and see what kind of mm -hmm. rates they're charging. Yeah, mm -hmm. Hamilton, we're seeing rates like $18, whereas you go into downtown Toronto, we're seeing $50. So the range can be drastic, mm -hmm. but markets aren't drastic. So you're not going to have somebody in Toronto asking $50 and then their neighbor asking $40. Right. They tend to stay on a very similar level for competitive reasons. Now, question, and, and I'm going to explain what a cap rate is, but what are the going cap rates in the GTA, yes. uh, Greater Toronto Area, for storage facilities? They have compressed and continue to compress at very shocking rates. You know, we, a lot of people had conversations two years ago, oh, wow, we're at a sub six cap. There's no way that it's going to drop below that. Oh, my gosh, no. But it is, yeah. Oh, that's, that's mortifying. So, you so know. So cap rate, just so our viewers will understand what a cap rate is, it really is the value that attributes to the real estate based on the income it's providing. Correct. So you have a net income. That means the gross income minus all your expenses. You have net income and every area or different type of real estate will have a percentage or a cap rate that everything is going for. Exactly. So, you know, for me, I'd love to find stuff at seven and eight. It's out there. It's just far away. Seven and eight. So the higher you go, the less of the price it is, and it's the best for us. Whereas yes. the lower the cap, which doesn't really add up in, in your thought process, but the lower the cap rate, the more expensive and you know, sub six, that's crazy. Yes. That was multi-residential pricing, right? So holy. And this has only just happened in the last few years. Yes. Because storage used to be an asset class that nobody really wanted to pay attention to. If you went mm -hmm. in 20, 30, 40 years ago, oh. your site that was worth nothing to buy or build back then has just drastically increased in value. Mm -hmm. And it's a great time to be an owner because you've got 10 people knocking on your doors that wouldn't think twice 10 years yeah. ago. I'm looking yeah. to buy self-storage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jamie, talk to us about why self-storage makes for a good real estate investment. Cell storage is viable in good times and bad. So you're mm -hmm. getting everyone from that antique car owner that needs to put their, mm -hmm. you know, their, their toy away for the winter season to, you know, a family that's struggling and, you know, maybe they were evicted and they need someone to put their stuff last minute. And then you have everywhere in between. But it's not just limited to the individual user. We're seeing a lot more businesses come in and take advantage of the rates mm -hmm. that you're seeing on a storage slide, on a storage unit. So for example, if you're a trade and you have peak times in your business, maybe in the busiest time of the year, you need a 10 by 30 unit. Rather than go out into the industrial market where the vacancies are so low and the rents are increasing in size because you can't find anything, you don't have to lock into any kind of long-term commitment. So while your business is really booming and you need a lot of space, yeah. you're it's in a larger unit. unit. And then as maybe your slower season comes down, you can just move within the facility to a smaller unit. Mm -hmm. So depending on where the, the site is, up to 30% of that facility could be rented by businesses. And that 
that's something that a lot of people don't take Very into consideration. And I know we had chatted a little bit about it as well, but you were mentioning that when it comes to rental increases, um, you know, st- self storage has kind of that flexibility that the the owners can go in there and increase as they see fit. So yes. Talk to us about that. Yeah. There are no restrictions in rental increases, and if you're watching Sorry. and that's you are a renter, happening. you're going to be kicking Probably. everybody right now. <laughs> but as an owner, it's amazing because. Yeah, there's really there's really no method to the madness. Yeah, exactly. So a lot of different groups, what they'll do is they'll follow the 7-Eleven or the nine, 6 and 9. So every six months, then nine months, you're going to get a rental increase. And wow. rental increases can be anywhere from 5 to 10%. The highest I've ever seen was actually in BC and Coquitlam. It was a 19% rental increase. Woo. And wasn't that in just a short period of time? It was in a short period of time. It's so it's I'm really going to be pretty upset if that happened to me. Yeah. Exactly. That, yeah. yeah. Anyway, we got to go to break. So there's okay. so much more and we could talk yes, for hours. Yes. So hold your thought. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Jordan, this is Carmen. Welcome back to 30 Minutes to Wealth. We're here and we're talking about investing in self-storage facilities. So to pick back up from what we were talking about, Jamie, talk to us about what factors would contribute to, you know, running a successful and profitable uh, storage facility. Okay. I know it's really cliche to say this when talking about real estate, but it really is location, location, location. And I say this because with self-storage, it's it relies a lot still to this day on drive-by traffic. So you want to be highly visible, easily accessible, and not outpositioned by any of your competitors. So you want to catch people as they're going as part of their daily route so that the day that they decide that they need yeah. self-storage, you're top of mind because they're used to seeing you every single day. You don't want to be in a location where... Yeah, they're going out of their way, exactly, right? Exactly. It's difficult to get to. Traffic counts are important, as is population density. Mm-hmm. So when choosing a new location to do any kind of development, build out, whatever it is, anywhere that there is a lot of residential development taking place, mm-hmm. self-storage isn't going to be far behind. So that's usually a key factor in determining whether that's or not a location idea. is going to make a lot of sense for you. If you're buried in an industrial zone, not ideal for storage. So that being said, you want to be looking at your population density, you want to be looking at your traffic counts, and then you want to be understanding who's coming in on the residential side of things. So I, I have a piece of land and it's in an industrial area. So that wouldn't be worth getting getting involved in uh, a storage facility there? It's worth taking a look at, Mm -hmm. but the biggest concern when you're a site that's buried is that if I'm going to, I've gone onto Google and I found a facility and I'm going to your facility, but I happen to drive by two or three on On the way way to get to yours, chances are I'm just going to stop at the first one that I see. I see. So you don't want to be out positioned in the sense that you're bringing everyone to your site, maybe through amazing Google ads, but they're still making that turn off to two other sites on the way just to get to yours because you're not in a prime location. Unless they're more expensive. Unless they're more expensive. Maybe I can be cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> You could, (laughs) yes. And then you may be able to generate some tenancies from other units, but Mm -hmm. it's often that once a tenant's come to your location, they're going to stay at that location regardless of the promotions Mm -hmm. that are. You're very right. Like we've we've had a storage locker before, and and if we would have to go back, we would definitely go there, right? So we just know it. It's familiar. It was good. It it worked out well. And once you're there, it's not worth going through the hassle just to move somewhere else to save a couple of dollars. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. Now, we want to talk about what are the three most common ways if people want to get started investing in self-storage, what are the best ways that they can do that? Yeah, Mm -hmm. so the three most common ways to get involved in storage from a very simple point of view is to buy an existing facility, to build a facility ground up, or to do some kind of conversion, which is traditionally in an industrial building. So if we were to start with acquiring, as we chatted about a little bit earlier, there's still thousands of units or facilities out there, coast to coast, depending on where you are. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a family-run facility and you happen to hear through the grapevine that this family is retiring. Mm -hmm. People only tend to sell for two reasons. They want the time, or they want the money. Mm-hmm. And if they don't need either, chances are they're not going to sell to you because as we have already been chatting about, it's a very lucrative business. Now, is it a ton of work for someone to manage that? Like, you know, it's more of a business. It's not just a rental property where you can have a tenant move in and then you have to um, 
manage them or anything like that. So yes. how, talk to, about that yeah. a little bit. It is a business and it is a common misconception that it's easy. That's, a lot goes into it. It's not that you just have one employee who's doing all of the work. There's a lot of systems in place. You want to understand your rental rates. These are softwares and things like that. So if you're an independently owned facility that maybe only has 100 units, that might be something that you can manage on your own. But if you're building a 100,000 square foot facility and you've got oh. hundreds of units, yeah. there's yeah. a lot of work that goes into it. Marketing is expensive. The software is expensive. It's, it's a lot more work than people think that it is. But right. I guess it is minimal from managing tenant perspective mm -hmm. compared to, say, owning an like apartment building yes. or a hotel yes. and having to manage right. all of those Because people aren't right? coming and going every single day. Yeah. So tenants are staying on average anywhere from six to nine months, and most of them aren't, unless they're one of the businesses that we've chatted about. Most people are maybe they're renovating, maybe they're moving, they're dropping their stuff off, and they're not coming back again for a lot of time. So you're sometimes not having the same amount of traffic. Even, right? Like exactly. if you've got your, your storage locker, sometimes people just want to like hold that right, in case they, don't they even come have back a need. Yeah. Yes. Storage wars. Like the storage wars. You see it all the time. <laughs> I love that show. You see it all the time. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah. Right. So where can good opportunities be found if people want to purchase an existing um, storage facility? Mm -hmm. If you want to purchase an existing storage facility, your best bet is to just knock on the door. Because it's not like you're going to find an, a facility coming up for sale on MLS mm -hmm. or on Realtor.ca the same way that you would in the residential world. If you want a site and you're driving by it every day and you think it's interesting to you, just go find out who the owner is. Find out who the manager is. Make a Build a relationship with this group because eventually maybe they want to retire. Yeah. Maybe they have another investment and they're looking for the capital. Another great opportunity is to do a joint venture partnership. That's and I think this also goes back a little bit to what we talked on earlier is, um, you know, purchasing these these smaller run or by the mom and pop type style as opposed to these larger ones. Because, yeah, maybe these people are um, not operating it as effectively as it could. And maybe investors lift. have an opportunity there to come in, exactly. increase rents, improve it and kind of um, increase the value in their ROIs that way. Yes, absolutely. So, again, if they've been run and managed for the last 30 years by the same family. It's a yeah. smaller site. They get to know their tenants over time. Chances are they're not increasing their rent every six, nine months. They might not even be increasing their rate every year, every five years. Mm -hmm. So for someone to come in to look at the rental rates, to look at the occupancy and see opportunity for growth, absolutely. Because you're going to buy that facility based on the income in place today. Mm -hmm. And if you can go in and raise it from yeah, a $15 rate to a $20 rate, you're laughing. So is there statistically... Um, population, location that you target or you focus on when you're looking for a storage facility. So if I want to go out and start looking now, you know, and let's say I'm going to go to the tertiary markets and, you know, I'm looking at uh, smaller communities, what would be the minimum population? Like, is there something that we can guide ourselves with in that process? Minimum population. I think as long as there's a good amount of development taking place and that development being either condos or apartments, that's where there's room for storage. Because if you're going into communities where people are living in larger houses, everything's a lot farther apart, it takes you know 20 minutes to drive from one end of town to the other, mm -hmm. then that's a little bit different than living in a high dense core market where you've got condo towers everywhere, you can build on a very, very small parcel and you can go up in density. Also your occupancy is gonna be faster and your rates are gonna be higher. Okay, so what about absorption? What if there's multiple storage facilities in the area? How do you know when not to do? This is becoming a very common concern for a lot of Canadian groups who own portfolios, small portfolios, one stop, um, or sorry, one or two facilities, is the amount of development that's actually taking place right now. And if we're speaking specifically about Ontario, even in just the GTA, there's probably 40 developments, self-storage developments going on right now in the GTA. Yeah. So while that sounds like a lot, Unlike in the U.S. market where we're seeing a nine square foot per capita self-storage space, here in Canada it's about three square feet per capita. So all of these groups who are coming in and building, they're not shying away from what you're referring to, which is a saturated market, mm -hmm. because there's belief that over time, in 10 years, there's well, going to be a need exactly. for it. Exactly. There's going to be a need for it. Well, look, at, they're still manufacturing all these things. Oh, yes. What are we doing with all the stuff that we already have? Right? So, uh, you know, me, I like to purchase 
marketplace and stuff like that. I, I prefer that because the old stuff is a lot more, it's better quality where you buy all the new, but where's all this furniture going? Where are all these things going? Yes, it's going into storage. It's going People into storage. storage. But the thing about it too is becoming the norm. Like how we talked about the outskirts of town that no one ever wanted to go to. You know, if you can walk down the street, go into your storage facility, you can just carry a box of stuff. Maybe it's your snowboard, maybe it's your golf clubs because you live in a condo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what storage is being used for in these higher dense, in the higher population density areas. Mm -hmm. You know, millennials are like, eh, I like to keep a clean space. I'm not yeah. gonna, I don't have a storage unit in my building to you be able to put storage this stuff. <laughs> so what are you she gonna do? Either. You're gonna take it to a storage facility. You already have like 10, so. <laughs> She needs a storage locker. There you but go. Yeah. So Jamie, what about those who are interested that have land that want to build um, storage from the ground up? Do you have any kind of like key points there that you know be that, that would be interesting to share with the viewers? So if you own a piece of land and you're not exactly sure what you want to do with it and you think that it would make sense for storage, two things that you want to look into is the zoning. You want to have employment land zoning. So it has to be employment lands. Yes, for the most part. Okay. It varies province by province, but if we're speaking about Ontario, the other thing that you want to make sure is that there's no environmental concerns because Big those one. are very costly and they stick with you. Mm -hmm. So yes. even once you sell that property, you just want to make sure that if you're going to go buy it or you own it, clean it up before you build on it. Mm -hmm. The other thing that you really want to look into if you're going to build a facility is the fees associated with the development charges because development charges okay. can increase your cost to build by millions of dollars depending on the market that you're in. Mm -hmm. Every single city has a different development charge, so that's definitely something to look into when you're trying to do your pro forma and understanding what right. it's going to cost to build at a site. Now, do you think I think it probably be wise to hire a professional consultant yes. to help you with yeah. that because you know, there's so many little things, like even in development, just regular development, you're working out your numbers. And, you know, when I started, I would have never thought of certain items that would be missing. So I, I, I highly recommend to our viewers that if you're not experienced in this, yes. that you hire someone like yourself that can come to the table with all the costs and you know exactly, is it worth it? Is right. it worth it? You want to know if it's worth it before you've already spent three or four million dollars. Really do your research. So before we finish up today, can you talk to us about one of the last ways, which I think is a really interesting concept, would be to convert an existing industrial space over to self-storage. Do you have any you know, thoughts on what investors should look for if they think that they have a suitable building? Yes, and this is a great way to get into self-storage is by buying an industrial building. We're actually seeing people buy retail buildings and office buildings and converting all of them to self-storage. Yeah. The great thing about it too is if, you to take, if you're to take or you own an industrial building, maybe it's 100,000 square feet, and 50% of it is vacant and 50% of it is occupied, you can phase out that development. So not only are you avoiding the development charges, you get to build out 50,000 to keep it easy. Your first phase, 50,000 square feet of storage, start your lease up process. As those tenancies roll over, you can continue to phase out your development. So you have cash flow in place while you're building That's out your storage awesome. facility. So for anyone that owns an industrial building and they're curious what to do with it, if they want to know if it's a good idea, what to do with the vacancy, maybe not go out and find 10 different tenants, storage is a really viable option. Is there option. a minimum size of a building footprint. that they would, yeah, footprint that they would have to consider? 100,000 square feet is a very safe number. So if you have a 100,000 square foot facility, you're gonna get about 75,000 square feet of rentable space, which is a good size. If it's a smaller market with a less of a population in a less dense area, you can get away with less. So yeah. you could build on a 40,000 square foot footprint, but what you're gonna to wanna to look at is the clear height. So if the clear what height does that mean? is 18 feet, so if your ceiling height is 18 feet or higher, what you can do is you can mezzanine that space, and now instead of having just 25 square feet, you now can build the second level, and now you've just doubled your footprint. That's amazing. This, this, I love it. I love it. I want to get into self storage. But you I should. About a lot of real estate. You should. Yeah, thank it. you so much for joining us today and sh sharing all of your knowledge and wisdom with yeah. respect to self storage. I mean, there's so much you can dive into here, yes. but I think this gives a really good perspective if people, you know, are interested in the topic of what options are available. Yeah. Thanks amazing. for having me. Thank you. So if you're interested in learning more about real estate investing, you can go to 30minutestowealth.com to see the rest of our episodes. That's it. Our 30 minutes are up. Go create wealth.